morning, everyone. My name is Kurt Hiller from the Penn State University, second class midshipman, and I am here and honored to introduce to you the current commanding general of the Marine Corps Recruiting Command. He was a 1981 graduate of the Franklin and Marshall College of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He was then commissioned as a second lieutenant through the PLC program in the Artillery Command. During his time in the Corps, he obtained his Master's in Military Studies, and he is now has three kids, uh, one boy, two girls, that have all graduated from Virginia Tech, and he's also a native New Jerseyan. Without further ado, here is Marine Corps Major General Mark A. Relakis. for making a decision arduous four years Those of you who I see maybe a little bit older who have done your service in the past, I just want to thank you for making that. Spring. Days, three days, excuse me, is November. That is the birthday of the United States Marine. Our anniversary. 239 years of history built upon the shoulders of young men and women on everything that their nation has had throughout the decade. Gather that cake is not just our and more. Those of you who were here yesterday, I mean, and I, I took a look at the, the program. What an amazing three days. Yesterday, you met and listened to young men and women who early in their lives made a decision to stand up, to serve, to count. No matter what that individual choice was, no matter where they came from, no matter what service they joined, they found themselves in very tough positions. I saw they paid. Not hear me back there? You can't hear me back there? All right, I apologize. They paid a tremendous price for their service. But I think what you saw in every one of those individuals is they are not satisfied to be characterized by their hardship. They live to be counted upon for their deeds. And their actions, their leadership, their commitment is the thing that you witnessed yesterday and heard in their testimony to you as they talked about what happened to them, how they recovered, and now what are they doing to count? What are they doing 
to stand up and be the leaders that they were in uniform and how they will be for the rest of their lives. Now you roll to today. Today's more about history. And what a tremendous, what a tremendous schedule today. We'll talk about the Tuskegee Airmen. You will have men who served their country, a country that was not so sure exactly what position they held in our country. But they chose to stand up. And they represent other groups, such as the Montford Point Marines, the soldiers of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team that fought so heroically in Italy and were made up of Japanese citizens whose families sat in internment camps that the government decided they should be in during the war. The members of the 65th Infantry Regiment, constituted primarily out of Puerto Rico, who fought so bravely in their time. And then the American Code Talkers, the Native Americans who did so much and came off of the reservations to serve a country, a Marine Corps, who quite frankly had little interest in who they were and what they were until their nation needed them in the most dire times that we'd ever experienced. So the gentleman from the Tuskegee Airmen will set up for you an example of commitment and courage and service that is rare in our history. Not unusual because so many when the nation needed them, they came forward. Then you'll fast forward to some of our great heroes. Sergeant First Class Melvin Morris, Medal of Honor winner. A personal hero of mine, Harvey Barnum, who I've known for a long time because Harvey Barney, as we know him, is an artilleryman. I'm an artilleryman. He's a Marine. I'm a Marine. He took over an infantry company and he fought it well well enough and bravely enough to win our nation's highest award in combat. And the day will go on and you'll talk about the Second World War and then you'll talk to veterans from the Korean War and then the Vietnam War, et cetera. So today is a day that lines up very nicely with what happened yesterday when you talk to our heroes from our latest wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. One of the things they asked me to talk about was a little bit about leadership. And as a Marine, I think those who are interested in the Marine Corps, you know that we're all about leadership. But the Marine Corps doesn't hold a patent on leadership. You see leadership across the country. You see leadership in your schools. But if we're talking about military leadership, we see it in all of our services. All of you are in uniform, one, one sort of uniform or the other, have chosen that you want to pursue a commission in the United States military. And you've chosen a path of service and sacrifice that is demanded from leaders. Leading is a fairly simple fundamental process. It's influencing people or a unit in such a way as to accomplish the mission. It's that easy. And it's really that hard. The things that you have learned in school the processes they've tried to teach you are just a very thin veneer on what leading your soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen in your future. You have spent time now working hard to develop skills, to understand what it is to be a servant leader, to understand that it is most important to know how to follow first before you can be expected to lead well later. Leadership is about sacrifice. It's about commitment. It is about laying yourself open to your people and giving them all that you can. When you're a junior leader, you are closest to your Marine, soldier, sailor, or airman. You're with them every day. You see the good, the bad, and the ugly. You are under the microscope of expectation and responsibility every day. As you progress and change, you will find that your leadership style 
what it is that you have to do to motivate a particular individual unit organization must be then modified as you become more senior. So as we, the services, bring you in and we begin to teach you those skills that we believe are necessary for you to, to flourish in our respective organizations, we need you to pay attention as you move forward. We need you to be open. We need you to be active, enthusiastic. In the Marine Corps, officers eat last, which means there's times where you don't eat at all. If somebody can't ride, the officer walks. That's who we are. That's what we do. Our Marines are important to us, as are the soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and Coast Guardsmen that are led in their particular services. Leadership is about sacrifice. How much you are willing to give of yourself to ensure that your individuals, Marines, sailors, soldiers, I'll say this over and over again, sailors, soldiers, airmen, and, uh, and uh, Coast Guardsmen, to make them successful. Yesterday at this time, I was in the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. Not a bad gig. <laughs> I was there for about 16 hours, which is unfortunately uh, kind, of the way I, kind of the way we roll. Uh, I command the recruiting enterprise. I've got 5,300 people across the country who go out and find young men and women who are interested in the Marine Corps. Officers, officer candidates, midshipmen, cadets such as yourselves, and ROTC scholars. How many of you are on a Marine Corps ROTC scholarship? Okay, you're mine. Okay. <laughs> but the fact is, is, that's what my guys do. So yesterday, what was I doing? Yesterday, I was sitting in the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, visiting Sergeant Civil. Of the 5,300 Marines and civilians that I have in my command, I have one sergeant who sits in a very small office in St. Thomas. And he is the Marine Corps recruiting force in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And myself, my sergeant major, his commander, and his recruiter instructor all went in, and my aide went to visit him. So it was five against one. But the fact is, is that Marine is leading every day. He's representing his corps to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. He is enlisting their citizens. Matter of fact, I was in, in San Juan at the uh, Military Entry Pro Processing Center, the MEPS, and I ran into one of his applicants who came up at attention, introduced himself as Mr. Archibald, told me what it is that he wanted to do and how his testing was going, and later on, when I finally got to the Virgin Islands, I saw Sergeant Civil. I told him, hey, I met Mr. Archibald. He's doing well. Sir, he's a good kid. He's smart. This is his family situation. This is how he does in school. We've had to spend a little time on math, he and I. I'm not really good in math, so I had to study before I sat down with him to help him with his math. <laughs> That's leadership. That's taking the time to understand what your mission is, and connecting with an individual, knowing who that person is, what his background is, what are his stressors, what, is, what makes him tick, and then doing everything you can to make him successful. So Mr. Archibald will be a Marine because Sergeant Civil, one, got a mission, but also he's a committed leader. And as a leader, he's all by himself. He sits around about a quarter million people. He is the Marine. He is in my uniform. He is squared away. He is known by the leaders of that, that community as the Marine. He has taken the responsibility and the mission, embodied it, committed to it, and he's making it happen every day. My job as a leader was to stop by, see him, listen to, listen to him, listen to his problems, see what I can do to make it a little bit easier for him, and then to get out of his way. And that's leading at a very large, at a very high level. His commanding officer who comes to see him every month 
spends a little bit more time. First time the commanding general's been down to the Virgin Islands about six years. Okay, it's, it ain't an easy trip. But the fact is, is every once in a while, you got to go and you have to show that leadership. You have to show that presence. His commander is there more often. He's closer to Sergeant Civil. Leadership manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Your biggest challenge as youngsters, and I can say that because I've got 34 years in the service. you got about three or four years in college. But you youngsters have got some challenges ahead of you in that you have got to learn. You're going to go from the warm embrace of the, your university to the cold reality of your service, whether you go to the basic school for the Marine Corps, you go to your branch training in the Army, you go to, I'm sorry, I don't know what the Air Force does. Air power. Air power. Space power. You forgot space power. Get that right there, young man. <laughs> but the thing is, is you're soon going to get away from that warm embrace of your university. You are soon going to get into the reality of what it is, and you have made a commitment. When you accepted my scholarship, when you got accepted by your academy, you made a commitment. You made a commitment to a kid who was not even out of middle school. And now he's in recruit training, and soon he's going to end up in a unit that if you're lucky, you'll get to be in charge of. And when you arrive in that unit, you have ultimate responsibility for that individual. Not only for him, but if he's married, for his wife, and if he's got kids, for his children. And it's not a legal responsibility, it's a moral responsibility. It's a moral imperative. You have to be prepared for that responsibility. You have to be prepared to put that responsibility ahead of anything you want. Your interests are secondary because you wear a cloth. You will put on those gold bars and you'll be in charge. And you'll have responsibilities that in certain cases will be shocking to you. Because at some point, you may have to point at a one of your 42 that you love and send them forward, naked. And they may get hurt. And they may get killed. And then you gotta go and point, find out in the next 39 exactly which one is gonna go forward. That's the seriousness of the commitment that you have taken. But I got to congratulate you. It's a great ride. It's the ultimate commitment that you will make in your life, other than the fact, other than the commitment you make to your spouse. But I tell you, when you get up in your bed, out of your bed at 2 o'clock in the morning for the first time, because one of your Marines just called and you're going to see him, she's going to be pissed. <laughs> Mine was. All right, I promised them I'd keep on schedule. I want to thank you all very much. I want to thank you for your commitment to service. I want to thank you that have served and done so well for our nation. I want to thank uh, the American Veterans Center for doing something like 17 years straight for doing something like this. It's phenomenal. I wish you all the best. Happy Veterans Day. Happy Marine Corps birthday. Ooh, Ross, Semper Fi. Ooh, Ross.